I passionately believe that all yeah. through the, the Horizon scandal, it could have only have got as bad as it did because there was no meaningful representation happening. The Federation isn't, in fact, a trade union then, even now. It hasn't been since 2015. Right. And, it, and therefore, it is just a private limited company, albeit not run properly, um, but they have no legal right to interfere in postmasters' contracts because they cannot. It's impossible in law to hold a collective bargaining agreement unless you're a trade union. It was common for an order to go to a branch, empty the safe so we could count everything, to be told by the postmaster, oh, that, that jar there or that tin's my overs and unders. Yeah. And I'll, it's got to be put, put into the account that you're counting. Um, so, yeah, that, that was common practice. But the real problem started is when you couldn't park the money whilst a further investigation took place. Not that any investigations were taking place, hence the post office having £12 million pounds worth of yes. um, yeah. money sitting in a suspense account that no one was doing anything with. No one was looking to find out why you put money into a suspense account. So, again, it was beyond even the post office. Or maybe they thought, well, why, why should we bother? We can always hold the postmaster to account because that's what the contract says we can do. Um, well, obviously, like every other postmaster back in uh, 1999, the year 2000, we all received this much acclaimed rollout of this new kit. Um, our paper-based cash accounts are going to be replaced with a digital way of uh, doing post office transactions. Um, it was all, a lot of postmasters were filled with trepidation. I felt quite excited. I was quite young then for a postmaster. So, you know, computers were like the iPhones to young people today. Um, and so I was, I was looking forward to it. Um, I um, went for my training, as did my wife, uh, and we started to work with Horizon. And for us, apart from a hiccup trying to get connected to an acceptable electrical supply, everything went as, as it should do. And Horizon performed. We didn't get any misbalancing. Um, so we started to settle down with it. Um, but shortly after receiving the kit, a friend of mine who um, was works within the uh, MOD in military IT, he'd heard about this new wonder system because it was big news in the IT world. It was the largest non-military network computer system in the whole of Europe. And so all the IT guys were all quite you know, interested in this. So mm. my friend came over. He had a look at it and he just was said, well, I'm, I'm a bit underwhelmed. He said, this is nothing more than a, an impressive but basic uh, architecture system of PCs, um, which are all connected over the Internet to post head financial headquarters. He said, so uh, he said, I'm a bit concerned, he said, because your cash account that you used to prepare was under your exclusive control. No one could touch it. Said, but this is a network system and there will be a series of administrators to that network who will have access rights. He said, you know, so you do need to be careful because this cash account of yours is no longer under your exclusive control. And I never forgot that, no. that warning. And presumably um, the and post office didn't. never told anyone that at the beginning. They no, never no, 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 it was never explained how this um network actually worked we, we we had to find out for ourselves um to everybody it was a computer it performed the transactions it recorded its the transactions on the hard drive of this computer and then once a week we we did it once a week in those days once a week it would upload your cash account to uh, a place we call chesterfield in the business that's our financial headquarters um and then you rolled on to the next cash account period and that that's the extent of knowledge that your average postmaster had. But I, but I knew that, you know, this was more than that because your information, your financial information was moving around the Internet. And what could go wrong with that? Who, who could control it? Who had access to it? Um, and as um, I started to get 
um, sub postmasters who were members of the Federation. I, I was a national official for the Federation. Um, That's my the Federation pat- of sub postmasters. Yes, the National yes, Federation yeah. sub postmasters. Yeah. They were a trade union back in those days. Yeah, yeah. They they fully supported this rollout. They gave it their approval. Um, you know, in those days, we only had the NFSP. Um, the majority of postmasters hung on their every word. So if they said it's okay, guys. It, yeah, everyone accepted it without question. Um, but nevertheless, the, the audits used, was started uh, and um, some of the auditors were reporting that they found shortfalls in Postmaster's accounts. And it was left up to people like myself and my other 12 colleagues who would be in charge of the various regions in the, in, in the country would have to represent these people and do our best to try and explain why there was this shortfall. Now, for my colleagues who probably had zero knowledge of computers, um, struggled to come up with explanations as to why it was short. So they just went into this default mode that they had, which was, well, the postmaster's stolen it, or he's lost it, or he's made big mistakes, but that will get spotted because this system can find mistakes. So you, uh, or, or you've got staff members or family members stealing from you. But they never would countenance um, saying it was could be the computer. And that's probably because they couldn't understand how a computer could make a mistake. So that and, and then there was over time, there was this um, almost uh what's the word uh they become totally obsessed with the system providing the future for the post office therefore if you threatened the integrity of the system you threatened the overall viability right. of the post office network right and that started to change people's behavior and it got to a point where if you so much as suggested it was horizon that was heresy, and you would be turned upon, and everybody would we, would vilify you as being a troublemaker, not knowing what you were talking about. Um, of course, it couldn't be computer; they didn't make mistakes. And you know, Horizon was the way forward. You've got to stop this um, this uh, notion that we should go back to the old days. This is the only game in town, so get used to it. And anything that goes wrong is clearly down to you in the branch. Uh, And so that was the approach most of my colleagues on the executive council would bring to disciplinary hearings when they represented people. And I used to hear horror stories of them speaking to me in, you know, in in the bar after meetings, they would be saying, I I took him to one side and I told him the best thing to do would be to admit everything. um, And um, I'd see if I can cut a deal with the contracts manager to, you know, to get him off. But, of course, he would have to repay the money. Uh, and, and that's how they dealt with um, discrepancies and representation. I took a different approach because my knowledge was building all the time. During the early days of Horizon, I was elected to my local county council. And shortly afterwards, I was asked to serve in the cabinet. That gave me access to working quite closely with uh, council officers um, and one of my portfolios was IT, so I got to I got to talk to all the um, the senior people involved in managing the county's um, IT. <laughs> They'd heard about Horizon, they were interested in it, and we quite often uh, would have discussions about it. And they introduced me to a concept called silent data corruption, which is where uh, a computer, when it does a transaction, it will put it into an information packet. And in the first version of Horizon, the information packets were held on the hard drive, waiting for the orders to be transmitted. Some transactions had to be transmitted immediately, such as banking or cashing a pension. Others could wait until the end of the week when the cash account was electronically prepared and the whole lot was sent up line. But it was a collection of data packets um, and these data packets were, could be subject to interference and corruption en route to the mainframe server where they would eventually find their way to your own branch's cash account. 
Uh, and, and another thing that would happen is, and this this manifests itself over over time, that the hard drives in the branches didn't really seem to receive any maintenance. And I don't know if you remember the original you know, early PCs. You had to defrag your hard drive regularly. Yeah. Mm. Otherwise, you could end up with broken sectors on the hard drive. And if a data packet was assigned to a a, um, a broken sector, it could get corrupted and be lost completely. So the transaction would go. Uh, similarly, on route, if it received any form of interference um, through the branch router as it tried to. Uh, dial up and log on and download the information uh, data packets could get corrupted in that process or they could get diverted off course um, and end up where I think a lot of transactions ended up in the post office's national suspense account where they admit after second site investigation they admit to having thousands upon thousands of unreconciled transactions sitting on the suspense account not knowing where these transactions belong to um so my, my whole approach was to horizon and representation was far more skeptical than my other colleagues um and whenever i interviewed a postmaster in preparation for him going to a meeting that we called an rtu which was a reasons to urge meeting where you had to essentially the post office never provided evidence of your guilt you had to prove your innocence yeah. because your guilt was already um, taken for granted as far as the post was concerned. So you get yourself into the contracts manager, my friend, and you tell us why you didn't do it and how you didn't do it. And of course, if you didn't have representation, you couldn't because you just didn't have the skills and the knowledge. Um, and even I struggled with my basic knowledge to try and make a coherent case to help people. But I improved over the years and I got quite good at it. And I, I, got a reputation of um, uh, not getting postmasters off because they were always made to pay the money back. But at least I saved their contract and they didn't lose their job and they were put back to work um, and they had to have this money deducted from their salary. And, and, and that's how most of my cases ended up. Uh, but it wasn't so um, nice for the uh, members who were represented by, by my colleagues they invariably got dismissed and still had to pay the money back. Um, later on, I started to, I, I think I only had one or possibly two cases where um, the member of my region had been arrested uh, and I had to go to the interviews um, that the post office security people um, would hold because all that would happen is if a postmaster was arrested, the policeman would do that. But he was immediately then handed over to the post office security people who would do all the interviews as if they were a policeman. They did have powers in the early days of Horizon. They did have powers to interview under caution uh, and to do the interview via PACE. And they would prepare a prosecution case against the individual. And then the post office legal department would take the case over and they would do the actual prosecution rather than the Crown Prosecution Service. And Mark, Mark you'd, you'd, you'd see them doing these interviews, would you? Would you be able to witness that? Yeah, I went into a couple. Yeah. Um, you, you'd go in, sometimes they'd ask you to go to the police station, which is very intimidating for mm. the postmaster. Yeah. Um, and he would be uh, read a caution and the uh, tape, the, the meeting would be taped. And uh, when the tape had finished, the meeting had finished, the tape would be sealed up and postmaster was given a copy, um, the investigators kept a copy. So you go into this meeting. Now, the post office investigators went to great pains to tell me as the, as the union rep that I wasn't allowed to say a thing. <laughs> and if I tried to interfere, I would be removed from the meeting. Um, the, my, my function was to sit and take notes and to be a referee against um, heavy handed treatment such as banging the desk, repetitive questioning, putting the individual under undue duress, I could step in then. Other than that, I was not allowed to say a thing to the member or answer for them or anything like that. Do you think, Which do you, think you were seeing, Mark, do you think you were seeing, uh, you know, people making a proper effort because you were there? Because the accounts we've heard have actually included all sorts of things which 
she shouldn't have happened. I mean, for example, cautions not given, recordings not made. If a recording was apparently made, the copy not being given to the sub postmaster, some yeah. redacted version being sent by email later, maybe if the person pressed for it, and yeah. definitely badgering and um, bullying type of interviews. So, you were, you were you were getting a better experience than what we've heard from some of the sub postmasters we've spoken to. Yeah, I think this. I mean, I'm familiar with the stories you've just said, and and mm. I, and uh, anecdotally, I was told by individuals that they'd heard that this happened to this individual. Um, so yeah, I, I was aware that there was some sharp practice going on. Um, and, and I've heard of stories like postmasters being kept in a in this room for hours. hours. Yeah. Like nearly a whole day. Yeah. Constantly being questioned, getting them to break down and giving it was them. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it never they wouldn't do it in front of me. And I would have grabbed my member by the neck and frog marched them out of the room if it had happened. I wasn't going to tolerate that. Um, and, I, and I think I ended up getting the respect of the uh, what we call the IB officers. They knew I played with a straight bat. And if I was there representing someone, it was because I generally believed that they hadn't done what they were accused of. And I, and I got that respect from the IB people and the contracts managers that did the first set of meetings. What's IB? Um, What's IB? I, IB's investigation branch. Right. Which we now know today as the Post Office Security it was called POID, Post Office Investigation Branch. They were part of the Royal Mail group because when Horizon was introduced, Royal Mail, Post Office were all just big one company. Mm. And it had its own security division, its own kind of policeman, if you like. Mm. They go back donkey's years um, and they had quite wide ranging powers. People don't realise how much power they actually had. They yeah. could set up covert surveillance they could get search warrants and come and search you in your home um they would they would stake out premises including your own home um and they could all do it without having to consult a wider authority they already had the powers we've to spoken not to very many but one of one of them nicola arch didn't want representation she didn't have a, a union official yeah. helping her mm -hmm. either because she thought she didn't need to that they would be reasonable and of course mm -hmm. they weren't and she got the treatment which is i'm you, you know i know you are a thief i'm i'm a, a C X C I D, and i know a thief when i see one mm -hmm. uh, and clearly they would behave in different ways according uh, dependent yeah. on who was there it seems yeah and on ordinary member of the public would call them bullies and indeed yeah. some of them were bullies and they could they could get a quick solution in the way they wanted it by engaging in this sort of conduct especially if someone like Nicola Arch had asked not to be represented either by a solicitor or or a union rep um they would take advantage of that I'm sure that they had no compulsion in doing so and I think that's how they got so many admissions of guilt because of the coercion that went on during some of these interviews. Um, and I, I just wonder whether or not any, any of these interviews of that nature took place with a federation rep sitting there, you know, refusing to actually do their job and step in and stop that kind of questioning. Well, with Gary because Brown, one he was told um, in no uncertain terms <laughs> a representative to keep his mouth shut. I think, you know, with, uh, I think, a few uh, swear words as well, you know, to shut the... Mm up if you yeah. if you're sitting here you know that's that's yeah. true isn't well that's it? how they spoke that's yeah. right um but of but, course yeah, as you they, say they, you they weren't were... supposed to be speaking you weren't supposed to intervene no i mean they were inti intimidating people you're right a lot of them were ex-police officers they they were invariably well-built guys mm -hmm. um and were used to dealing with hardened criminals and yeah. would view the postmaster as a hardened criminal and treat them accordingly if it was a means to an end to get the confession. Except somehow, someone, except sorry? somehow, I mean, I did crime for a long time and they don't, they don't, the, the ones I've seen, they're nothing like hardened criminals. <laughs> you no, know, a po a post, you have to remember when a postmaster is appointed, not, not so, um, not so these days, but back in the day, a postmaster was uh, vetted very, yeah. very heavily. Yeah. And they were chosen for their uh, honesty and their integrity that, based on the sort of life they'd led before applying for the role. Um, you were being appointed almost like a member of the government. It was the same sort of vetting that you would go through if you apply to work for your local authority. You know, they 
they have to have honest, upstanding people yeah. working in a position of public trust. And a postmaster held a huge amount of public trust. So you, you couldn't be just any old Joe uh, saying, oh, I'd no. like to run a post office. No, you, you, you had to demonstrate through business plans and questions at interview um, that you understood the responsibilities you were taking. Um, you had to prove your financial security. So you had to provide all your information on savings and how you conducted your financial affairs. You had to be squeaky clean. Mm. And so for these people to suddenly turn to crime, it, <laughs> no one stopped at the time. No one stopped to say, what have we done? What's going wrong with our recruitment process that we seem to be a, seem to be hiring all these criminals? Mm. Because it, it was implausible. That, that, you know, and it was this just this irrefutable belief that this computer system, if it says you're short, you're short. And that's the end of the matter. And it can only be crime, you know, to explain this discrepancy. And you presumably then, were unconvinced of that. You you were you were hearing of cases where it didn't look like it could possibly be a crime. Well, when, when I sat my members down, I, I always grilled them as if I was an investigator myself. I always grilled them to see if I could trip them up. I'd ask them loaded questions and things like that in a, in a nice way. But I needed to know if I was going to put my reputation on the line. I wasn't going to get um, tripped up at the last minute by someone that's told me a pack of lies. And I would get to know, you know, the circumstances of their branch. So I, I would I would ask them, what's the record of electrical supply to your property? Does it did you have regular power cuts? Does your building suffer from severe vibrations? Or do you live near a railway, for example? Um, I would asked to eat I would probably go and visit their branch to look at the horizon installation uh, I went to one branch I remember it quite clearly he had about four pcs under the counter but the back end was facing towards where people sat and served and so they were swinging their legs whilst they were working they were kicking all the cables and you know that that could cause cables to momentarily disconnect um, immediately, I would say, well, there's an explanation of what could have gone wrong here. Um, other, other areas I would look at is the communication setup. Um, how robust was their router? Was their router actually working? Was it defaulting to the mobile phone backup? Um, you know, and I would ask for information on the comms link record of, of that branch to see if there was lots of in, you know, interruptions. Um, so it's general, I build a picture of the physical branch, as well as the experience of the postmaster, what staff had access to um, the post office uh, assets, was any family members that allowed behind the counter, all these things I would build in to see you know, if I could paint a picture of what was going on in that branch. And when you heard from people to say, well, my computer screens were continually flickering or um, yes, I kept having to reboot Horizon or I couldn't get onto the Internet for ages and I had transactions in the stack. Um, <laughs> there was a clue for me that this could be IT related. And I would make those suggestions to the contracts managers during the interview. Um, and I think after a while, some of these contracts managers came to the same conclusion that I was not talking rubbish like everyone said I was. Uh, and I, and I would invariably get the people reinstated to their, to their branch, but obviously on the understanding that they had to pay back the money, which always stuck in the craw. But I said to the guys, well, you know, at least you haven't been stacked like hundreds of others have been. And you, you know, you, you, you've got a job. So eventually you'll end up paying this off. So did you um, did you start to form the impression at any time that Horizon was actually not functioning correctly? I mean, regardless of the the issues you've been describing, yeah, that it was actually sending out false data. Did, um, did... No, I I I struggled with that because I didn't know enough about no. computer programming, how software can can go wrong, um, and I and I only had this one warning about remote access. Mm. But my friend did assure me 
and so did the IT guys at the county council. They did assure me that if anyone tried to access as an administrator, that is a audited record of who it was, when it was, and what they did when they were there. It should be. So that kind of made me feel a little bit more relaxed. Didn't alter the fact that I firmly believe that the cash account was no longer our full responsibility, even though our contract that we had and were held accountable for Horizon shortfalls under the terms of that contract, that contract was never written for a computer. Something always rankled me. And I used to bring it up at our executive council meetings, saying, when are we going to get a new contract that makes sense of digital accounting? And they all just sat and looked at me. It's Mark again. He's talking. He's, he's looking for ghosts where there are none. He's, and and I, I just get dismissed. But I think it's because I was raising subject matter that went over their heads. And so it was easier for 12 of them to outgun me. And uh, I was always passed off as a bit of a crank and a troublemaker. Mm. Um, but the, the, my, my main uh, mantra at the time was hardware and connectivity. Power, connectivity, the, 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 the state of the actual physical equipment. I could understand that and I could make an explanation as to how that side of Horizon could go wrong. What was beyond me was people inserting code. I didn't even know what code was in those days. Um, and so that I learned literally like probably everyone else. I learned all about that side of Horizon from the Horizon trials where, where these experts came and gave an explanation as to how um, software could be to blame. And um, But I, I always focused on the, the hardware side. Did you ever did you ever come across the computer system spitting out surpluses so that it looked as though the sub postmaster had recorded had put in too much money um, rather you than really too little? got to hear about those because of the post office's method for dealing with a surplus. You you would if you rang up uh, on balance day to say I'm a thousand pound over, they say all right fine well here's a reference number. Um, what you do is you you take the money out. And then you can declare a balance and you can roll over into the next period. We said, well, what am I going to do with this money? Well, don't worry. You'll get a transaction correction notice arrive at some stage from Chesterfield. Um, put the money in a drawer. Keep it safe. Put it in the bottom of your safe. Just leave it there until someone comes looking for this money. And that's how they would tell you to deal with uh, surpluses. No one ever did come calling for it. And I'm sure a lot of postmasters kept the surpluses that um, that were generated. But I mean, some some of the deficits were like tens of thousands of pounds, weren't they? So you might expect surpluses of the same size, which would be embarrassing to entirely keep in possible. Draw, you know? Yeah, entirely possible that some people um, had a huge surplus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's a new a new thought, isn't it? I hadn't expected you to say that, and the very fact that nobody would even call to get it because they don't have enough information only if really. they could only if they could identify that it had been caused by a transaction and usually what would happen is the first person to notice something going wrong is going to be the client people like national savings bank or gyro bank they would do their reconciliation from the data they got from the post office and they would find that one of the transactions hadn't arrived wasn't recorded and it could be traced back through the system Right. And sure enough, it, it would be in the branch because the postmaster balanced over that week uh, and informed the, the helpline that they were in surplus and they're keeping the cash in a tin box in the safe. <laughs> and this is this is another thing, Mark, because, as you say, there was an end customer, wasn't there? Like, as you say, National Savings or some other uh, bank yeah. uh, or, or organisation, and they would be keeping a tally of the money coming in and out. And one of the things we've never been able to understand is with these deficits that sub postmasters were accused of stealing, um, was any money actually missing? Because you think that some one end, an end user, an end customer would be reporting that money was missing. But as far as I've heard, nobody's, nobody's I mean, I don't know how they could have been missing and money. That's an of area that. of that's an area of interest and it's never been uh, explored. No one's ever shined the spotlight on the interactions between the post office clients and the post office. Anecdotally, I know some clients would ring up and say, this is wrong. They would never be argued with 
the postal would just make it correct because they knew that if that caused them a shortage, they knew exactly who to go and get to repay it. They'd turn on the postmaster. Yeah. So if a client reported something that had gone wrong, it was not questioned. It was just the, just the client accepted. was immediately settled with. Post Service then would take steps to get to get their money back off whoever they could blame for it. But, it, but so, when you have you have people like Wendy <laughs> saying, for example, that a whole lot of stamps turned up in her um, what she called it in her stock. Um, which yeah. which then she had not paid for. They would um, say. And you'd think that there must be some kind of paper trail of some sort to show what stamps are ordered, what stamps are delivered. Um, and, you, you know, that, that, that simply having a computer record showing that there's too many stamps in her stock would not be the whole story. There must be a whole process from printing stamps to delivering them to post office, selling them to clients, which keeps track yeah, of stamps it wasn't just like cash. It was, yeah, stock and cash was not as efficient as that in the early days of Horizon. You, you would manually order your stamp stock. Um, uh, you would submit a, a requisition for it, or you do it over the phone, uh, and you'd order your stock. It would arrive. You would check it physically to, to see that the it was the right amount of stamps that you had ordered, then you would have to manually book those stamps into Horizon. Mm. And then Horizon would work its way through them as you sold them and give you a report at the end of the week. And in theory, the amount of stamps you had sold should tally with what has left. And that's the way it all worked. But quite often it didn't. And it could be for many different reasons. It could be you didn't notice um, a sheet of stamps was missing from the book from the pile could be that you've entered the wrong figure uh, or it could be that horizon has been miscalculating and not keeping your stamp reconciliation correct leaving you either over or short so lots of ways stock could go wrong and it's the same process with cash because cash is just to us it's pieces of paper it's just stock and that would be booked in and out in the same way and as you sold things it would reduce your cash holdings accordingly and, and the, then what's left at the end of the week should equal the figures of, of cash that you've either taken in or, or sold. I would like to know, please, Mark, from your perspective, mm -hmm. how often did people balance their accounts? You mean right, correctly? The, yeah, correct. We, so, it, so it balanced, you know, because we are hearing from, from some of these so, uh, sub postmasters saying, you know, we were told it would hardly ever balance. And in fact, if we did balance... The auditors would come and visit because <laughs> it was so unusual and suspicious. <laughs> I think what those people are referring to is if you, um, it, it's rare for a postmaster to get a zero balance first time of asking, with the exception of my wife, who seems to do it every month. Oh, she's she's some woman. She's that, she's that good at. I mean, she's always been good with the accounts. And she she was part of the Crown Office Network as well as I was. And in those days, we were trained properly and thoroughly and received regular training. Uh, and she's always been able to balance the, the, the post office accounts. And when she when she hits that button at the end of end of every trading period, she, she balances to the penny. But when people say, oh, we were told not to let that happen, it will attract the attention of the auditors. What they're meaning is you would get a variance figure, first of all, that wasn't balancing, that was giving like a, a, a um, what am I likely to end up like if I go ahead and commit the balance? So it's like a preview. And when they saw the preview, like you're um, 15 pounds short, you were encouraged to go and adjust that 15 pound by putting it in and then re-declaring um, and balance to zero. Your own 15 pounds though, it would be. If, if, yeah, if you, yeah, you had to put, because you or were just short, find you were it somewhere. To put the money yeah. in. Yeah. Um, and then you would, then you would go commit your balance. And that's when you would get a zero balance because your balance, you could roll over. Because yeah. what you can't do is roll over without balancing. Without balance. You've got to hit, you've got to hit that zero balance. But yeah. what, what would attract the attention of auditors if, if there was habitual changes to your cash on hand figure or your stock on hand figure? because that would indicate you're making the jigsaw piece fit by covering up a shortage by saying, oh, my variance has said I'm a hundred pounds short and 20 pound notes. I haven't got a hundred pounds. 
So what I'll do is I'll tell Horizon that I've got this hundred pounds in 20 pound notes and then I'll redeclare my cash and then I'll roll over. That gets spotted because there's no reason, especially if you did it more than once, that, that's when the alarm bells will be triggered. Because why is this branch checking his cash five or six times at the end of the day and altering the figures all the time? Why is that happening? It's because they're falsifying the account. That was the immediate thought. And yet auditors would get dispatched. Right. And sure enough, they would see from the in-branch records, yeah, you were con constantly calling up for variances and finding you were short, adjusting it. And you might start doing this multiple times because you perhaps made a mistake in the way you, when you did the adjustment, so you had to go back and do it again. But there isn't really a, a good reason why you would um, regularly, at the end of every trading period, regularly be adjusting your cash on hand. You might do it once but you wouldn't really do it multiple times. And you think and that's I, what they might have been doing? And I think that's what some people were doing. Uh, and that's why you were told never, never show a zero balance. Right. In the early days of Horizon, it used to have something called a suspense account. So yeah. if I balanced £100 short back in 2002, if I balanced £100 short, I could say, well, I've no idea what I've done wrong. I've checked all my paperwork. Yeah. Um, I'll just put it in the suspense account and see if someone's going to send me a transaction correction. Maybe I've done something that's yet to be reported. Yes. And a client will report it and I'll get my money back. Yeah. So you would park, you would park this money in the suspense account and it would let you roll over. Yeah. Um, but the, it got spotted that there was at one point over 12 billion, a million pounds of money in sub postmasters suspense account, you know, mm -hmm. built up across the network. And some auditor came along and said, well, we can't have this. Um, so they just took that suspense account away. And that's when the trouble really started, because the postmaster started to have to make good there and then. Well, uh, Gary Brown was told to get a tin, wasn't he? So he, he instead of a suspense account, he had a jam jar or something. Yeah, that was, was common. Served yeah. the same purpose. It was common for an auditor to go to a branch, empty the safe so he could count everything, to be told by the postmaster, oh, that, that jar there or that tin's my overs and unders. Yeah. And I'll, it's got to be put, put into the account that you're counting. Um, so, yeah, that, that was common practice. But um, the, the real problem started is when you couldn't park the money whilst a further investigation took place. Not that any investigations were taking place, hence the post office having £12 million worth of yeah. um yeah. money sitting in a suspense account that no one was doing anything with no one was looking to find out why you put money into a suspense account so again it was beyond even the post office or maybe they thought well wh why should we bother we can always hold the postmaster to account because that's what the contract says we can do and that's why you introduce this you've got a balance on the night you can't roll over if you don't so therefore you owe us this money <clears throat> yeah yeah and, and um, my advice to my members, um, and it remains so to this day, although we do have a different procedure now, thanks to the High Court term trials, um, is the only legal way of absolving yourself from responsibility of, the, of taking ownership of the discrepancy is to freeze, refuse to roll over, and refuse to open up your branch the next day until someone comes to help you. Absolutely. That seems nobody, very sensible. Nobody would do that. Nobody they don't do it. They won't. They won't. They won't shut their door on the public. Hmm. That's the problem. It's the dedication gene in a postmaster's brain. He'll put a customer's well-being before that of his own. And his but own they, bank balance. But they and, suffered and it, It's horribly. frustrating. But that is the only way you could do it. To... to Stop yourself doing stupid things like altering the figures to make them fit Absolutely. just so that you can open up the next day. And yeah. that's where a lot of people um, did do that and were sort of made false confessions about yeah. what it is they were doing. Yeah. Um, well, they become guilty of false accounting, genuinely guilty of false except accounting. Except that they gained no pecuniary advantage. No. And it couldn't be proved that the post office had suffered a pecuniary disadvantage either. So to my basic understanding of that particular crime, false accounting, it couldn't be proved that they committed proper false accounting because no advantage had been gained. They were just 
hiding, if you like, um, an accounting error that couldn't be explained. They'd not got the money. They hadn't taken the money out the safe. In a lot of cases, the, am the amounts of money that had gone missing exceeded the possible level of cash holdings that branch would have had. So you take a branch that have been told, well, you're 32,000 pounds short. Well, he's got a little safe about that big. He's not going to fit 32,000 in there. And even if there was, you wouldn't be able to open up the next day and trade because what money are you going to give the customers if you'd nicked 32 grand? Well, Nicola Ash's story was Arch. hilarious, really, because, Arch, sorry, because she, um, she was doubling the deficit every time she tried to correct it. And yeah. she, but doubling it soon would be really the whole of the, millions. You know. be, it would be millions if she yeah. stopped before it became millions. But yeah. she should have persisted because the ridiculous nature of the That's one of the problems with the horizon. Even post office officials didn't have a full understanding of how to correct something when it had gone wrong. Mm. And you just dug the hole deeper. You the old metaphorical story. You got your spade. You should have stopped digging, but you don't. You keep digging, and it just gets worse and worse and worse. Yeah, I have seen doubling up happen um, in more recent times. And the the uh, Dal Mellington bug is a classic example where uh, she was one of our members. And she got mentioned in the high court case where she was transferring uh, cash from what one stock unit to her portable one when she would go off around the Scottish Highlands and serve in village halls using portable horizon kit. She, she was putting a REM from one stock unit into the uh, portable unit so she could go off and trade the next day. And she went through the normal routine, you scan the barcode on the REM pouch, and that automatically populates your cash holdings with the money that was in that pouch. And she thought nothing of it. She turned her back on the machine to do something, and she heard the printer motor still going. So she looked round expecting to see one receipt for the money she'd allocated to the stock unit to find there were four or five. So she had the presence of mind to pounce on the computer and pull the power out, and that stopped it. And what this glitch was doing, based on a rogue barcode, it was going into a loop of funding this stock unit over and over and over again. She would have been so pounds. rich within <laughs> minutes. Sorry? She'd have been so yeah. rich within minutes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've got a, a an incident happens. It's the, virtually my neighbouring office just down the road. They took a, a pouch of money in. Again, it was to do with self-populating horizon. And the way it works is when you order money, it, it will be broken down into the denominations that would be coded into a barcode as to what was in that pouch. So that when you zapped that barcode at the receiving end, horizon would say, right, I've acknowledged this money. And I'm going to populate the postmaster's cash account with the following denominations. Except that when he did his, only the five pound notes got populated. <laughs> and he was left with, I think the figure was 64,000 pounds in surplus. All right. So he, he rang up the help desk who went into automatic mode and said, oh, I'm sorry, mate. It's a lot of money, but you've got to make good. He goes, you didn't listen to what I said, did you? I'm actually that amount over. Oh, oh, and as if it just helped like never, never heard this happening before. Uh, but it took an age to get an error notice out of them to come and clear the discrepancy. And it's their money. Yeah. Again, and caused is, by this a road Recently. Bar. This is recently. Yeah, within the last two years, that was. Last, within the last Good 18 Lord. months. Ago. Yeah. Mis mistakes are still happening on Horizon. Happened to my own branch. Had a customer come in. And I got the postmaster to investigate this in a much more detailed way than I've ever had any discrepancy ever investigated. Um, but that's only because, you know, the press were watching the high, high court had just ruled. Um, so they were doing their best to demonstrate they were doing all they can to find discrepancies. Um, but um, customer came in, wanted to withdraw 50 pounds. I think it was it might have been 100 from his nationwide account. So he put the card in, the prompt came up, put your PIN number in, and on his screen, it said declined. Now, the guy's actually got loads of money. He's no way was he ever not going to have money in his bank account. Uh, and so he said to my wife, oh, it says declined. So she goes, well, yeah, it's come up on my screen as well. 
So he, she said, well, take your card out and we'll try again. He, and so he tried it again, got the same message. So she said, shall we do a balance inquiry just to check? He goes, yeah, I think you ought to. So he did a balance inquiry and that came out correctly. And he saw he had the money. He said, oh, you know, look, she's like, Here's, I've got money. Why is it declining? She goes, well, let's try once more. He goes, no, no. He said, I've had enough of this. I'm going to go to the bank and I'm going to speak to them right away. So we went straight to Nationwide because it's only four miles away. Uh, and he walks in and there, it was the, the lady behind the counter was so blasé. It was as if, oh, not another missed withdrawal from the post office. So she checked his account. Yes, here's the transactions. They both went through. He goes, but it declined twice in front of me. Here's the tickets. She goes, well, you can see off my statement here, that off our computers, the money was taken from your bank account. And without question, she just counted out what he was owed because as far as she was concerned, that customer's made happy and he got what he asked for. Then he came back to my wife and showed her what happened. So I reported this uh, and that's when we got the thorough investigation, but they never... They never gave me, they never 100% convinced me that it wasn't what we call a, a phantom banking transaction, a one-sided transaction. Because we know through the activity, through the investigations of Second Sight, there are such things that happen called one-sided transactions where the handshake between all the different computer elements doesn't complete. One, one handshake's not taking place, either leaving that customer with a benefit or leaving that customer short or the postmaster either in surplus or short or the post office either in surplus or short and that is an identified syndrome that happens with horizon and i'm convinced it happened in this particular one occasion and we've got an independent customer who who can verify it and he's still to this day he's adamant that he saw um the declined message on the, the little screen on the pin pad mm. Um, the post would say that message never appeared on their records. So we've we heard are, that story, like such a thing has never happened and could yeah, never happen. Yeah. It's the same old, do you think you know, when, you, when you reach an impasse, how, how do you prove? How do they prove it wasn't there? How do I prove it wasn't? You know. Absolutely. Well, we all have to carry our cameras these days. Do you, do you I think, can't see well, any other way. You, you want to see what my wife's done downstairs at the branch. We bought these little cameras, like they're like little GoPros. Mm -hmm. And they're all strapped down to the countertop, and one of them constantly monitors horizon. Mm -hmm. And we've we've had to get into that position where yeah. we distrust our own equipment, and we now know that we need to film everything that happens on it. We've got yeah. a camera up here watching what happens. We've got this camera right in front of the screen watching what happens. It makes sense. Something Very good wrong, idea. Yeah, and we're about to report our equipment because it keeps um, trying to log itself out when it shouldn't mm -hmm. do. And we've got, we've got that we've got that on film. So when I when I can spend a few hours trying to get through to our IT department, I'll have to call it in to say there's something wrong with my system. And are there are a lot of um, cases where postmasters are being told they owe they owe the post office, you know, 20, 20 pounds, two hundred pounds, and and is this still going on? Oh yeah, people are still misbalancing. Uh, and now, of course, if they're a member of the union, we remind them of the new procedure which is that we've kind of got our suspense account back and um, what you do now is if you disagree with the discrepancy and you want further investigation you hit settle centrally and then there's a dispute button so right. your local unit is cleared zeroed and allowed to roll over but the discrepancy is logged in an account unfortunately in an account that's in the postmaster's name so you haven't been relieved of the debt, but they allocate that discrepancy to your account, which is held at Chesterfield, and they allegedly start to investigate as to why they think it may have happened. And if they can provide any of our members proper proof, proof that meets my union standards of proof, not theirs, ours, and they can prove that the postmaster made the error, then that postmaster will be advised by me to make good. But until that happens, we say to the postmaster, do not pay them a penny. Now, just after the common issues judgment, they started to in issue demands for payment. It looked very much like an invoice which they expected you to pay. 
But if any of our, and I don't know how many postmasters have just coughed up because the letters look like a, a, a red letter, pay up or else. It does say it tiny print at the bottom. You can put this into dispute if you contact us. Um, but I, I make sure all our members are aware that they do not have to make good, not without the evidence. That's what the judgment said. And we expect the post office to provide the evidence. And I, I'm, I will issue an FOI one day to find out how much money is sitting in these accounts now? Because it's been two, two years or so since the common issues judgment, since this new facility to challenge has been introduced. How much money is mounting up in these accounts? Because it'll all be you know, a collection of small amounts, 100 here, 200 there. Um, you, to, to be honest, you don't hear these big discrepancies anymore. Um, but nevertheless, there are the smaller, un, under a £1,000 style discrepancies happening every month and of course you don't know if people are just paying up do you either i don't know no i've got no oversight of the whole network if i had a collective bargaining agreement i could sit down with the head of um chesterfield's finance department and we could talk about yeah. you know how many people are reporting this to you yeah. the postmas keep all that information close to their chest but isn't it, isn't it that another reason, Mark, for people to join your union? I, I would urge them to if they're if they we're only here it. to help them. You know, we want to get into a position where we can properly represent them. And we've even gone to the expense of taking the post office to the employment tribunal to force through workers rights for postmasters. So they got some minimum standards of employment. Um, and as a as a side product of that, we would be able to then if we were successful in getting work status conferred on us, we would be able to apply for a collective bargaining agreement through another process. Um, so they're the links we're prepared to go to, to protect postmasters. And until it happens, we can never be sure, none of us can ever be sure that the horizon scandal will not happen again at some stage. Absolutely. That would be what I would be asking people to think about. If you put yourselves in the position of, of taking on one of these contracts, then you need to protect yourself. And I would have thought joining your union would be one of the first ways of doing that. Well, as I say, that's our mission. And we've been banging away now for the last 10 years or so, trying to achieve our ambition to you know, represent who are no more than a bunch of key workers within the postal industry. Mm. And we represent people all over the postal industry. We've even got um, people who are in a very similar position to postmasters, uh, IT contractors who work within the communications industry, and they now have their own branch within the CWU. And they work on non-conforming style contracts of engagement with people like BT uh, and sometimes Royal Mail. Um, and the parcel force drivers, some of those are... Uh, are allegedly self-employed again you know they need the protections that um are given to that group of people called workers yeah doesn't make them doesn't stop them being self-employed doesn't make them employed it just means that because you only do your work for one employer you can have some protection yeah. and of course you get the benefit of having an organized body who is totally independent negotiating your terms and conditions who would turn that down only only very somebody who's very silly, Mark. And, and if you go to a lawyer, just think of the amount of money you would have to pay for that mm. kind of advice. It would be phenomenal. Yeah. What, how much are your subscriptions just out of interest? Uh, at the moment, because we're not uh, uh, we haven't got the collective bargaining agreement, it's about nine pounds a month. Right. So it's not a fortune, is it? If we got recognised and we did the negotiating, it would only go up to about 14, 15 pounds a month. Mm. Um, well, worth, it's well worth not paying a, for it, that then. Some people will happily pay membership of, uh, say, I don't know, the Federation of Small Business or the Federation of Retail News Agents. They'll, they'll join them as a, as a lobbying body. You'll get no more from them than that. But that hundreds of pounds a year yeah. membership fees. One of the things which I'd like to understand a bit, because you were you were part of the Federation and um, you were dealing with the sub-postmasters and you were coming across the inter in investigation board people mm. uh, how 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 do you understand the ethics of that organization to have evolved I and mean, i can understand if if people just take a kind of perhaps thoughtless attitude that is we're told the computer can't be wrong therefore we must 
treat these people as though they're criminals. Yeah. We assume it, it's the easiest thing to do, but it does sound as though the whole system became cruelly corrupt, really. Uh, you know, driving people, you know, treating people in a way which seems absolutely inhumane when you hear their stories. And, well, if um, I give you a bit of history to the Federation, yes, please, because yeah. I admit I was a bit slow on the uptake when it came to it dawning on me that the organisation I was active in was not what it's supposed to be. It was a completely different organisation. But going back to the creation of the Federation, which was back in the 1800s, it's, it's a very, very old organisation. It was set up as a guild, a guild for postmasters. Um, and it was nine, in the 19, uh, yeah, early 1970s, I think it was, um, somebody in the Federation realised there was an advantage you had tax-wise to register yourself as a trade union. In those days, trade unions um, had no uh, regulator. There was no one policing trade unions. Um, you could just bit like declaring yourself a charity if you met the criteria you could be a registered charity same with the union if you met the criteria you could register as a trade union and there was no official list of these trade unions but they grew and grew and grew and then it was in the margaret thatcher years she decided she needed to tidy up this she wasn't very happy with trade unions for other reasons and so she thought right we need to bring a bit of uh, order here so in the uh 1992 trade union act she invented a department called the certification officer and the certification certification officer managed and policed all trade unions and employers associations and he kept records of them annual returns had to be made declaring your your funds uh and you you had to uh, register yourself as a trade union the problem was when the certification officers department was created, the first certification officer did not go and examine all the trade unions in existence at the time that he inherited. He just stuck them on a list, which then became known as the list of trade unions. Oh. And there were unions on that list that shouldn't have been a trade union because they didn't qualify, not under Mrs. Thatcher's new act. So the Federation got away with it because they, they were one of the early birds, early adopters, and they stayed on this list for donkey's years. Right. Submitting trade union returns, holding elections as if under the trade union law and all that kind of thing. Now, when I first joined the post office back in um, the 80s, late 70s, early 80s, uh, I was employed by the Crown. I became a, what we call a post officer, I worked on the Crown office counter, Spent 10 years doing that. Um, and the natural union to belong to then was the it was the union of postal workers, then became the communication workers unions, CWU. And um, so that that was my experience of a, of a trade union. When I bought my own sub office, the CWU wasn't recognized to represent postmasters. So you were told, well, the, the trade union to join is the NFSP. National Federation of Sub-Postmasters, which I did because my mother-in-law at the time was a sub-postmistress. She told me all about the Federation or the Fed as it was called. Uh, and so I saw no problem with joining another fellow trade union. But it was over a period of time once I got involved in that organisation and particularly when I then got elected into national office within the Federation, I was a national trade union official. And I didn't recognise what I was seeing going on at a national level with what I had witnessed going on within the CWU. The, the, the two were not working like they should do. Um, so I started to ask difficult questions. Why aren't we doing this? Why aren't we doing that? Um, and basically, it, I was fight, ended up fighting my own organisation. And I was regularly in skirmishes with the general secretary of the union, I even took him to an employment tribunal once um, over un unfair discipline of a trade union official um, because I felt that their conduct was so poor in representing members. Um, so that, that's how the Federation got to become a trade union, but it wasn't behaving like a trade union. Mm. In the end, um, it got so bad that the CWU decided 
these postmasters must have some form of proper representation run under strict trade union rules. So we will now offer to take on sub postmasters as, as members. Um, and that's where I changed allegiances. I, I left the Federation in disgust and I went to take a, a place setting up the postmasters branch that I'm now branch secretary of to this day. Um, so you had two organisations vying for postmasters membership. But um, shortly after our uh, CW postmasters branch was set up, the uh, complaint was made by existing Federation members that the Federation was not um, financially independent of the post office and that they should not be allowed to be called an independent trade union. And because their certificate of independence, which has to be renewed every year by proving your financial stability, that certificate of independence was not valid because they were financially beholden to the post office. Because what the posters would do, they wouldn't recognize them as a trade union, which was a bit suspicious. But they would say, we will de facto recognize you and you can be the one in charge of negotiating the terms and conditions for postmasters. And we'll, we'll set up a pseudo form of collective bargaining agreement and give you a facilities grant that keeps you funded without being wholly reliant on membership subscriptions. But because we're providing the funding under nefarious methods, you'll do as we say and we'll control you. So we don't want any trouble from you lot in the Federation. And that's how the, the dominance of the post office over the Federation started. Was that made and explicit? Got, or, or, I mean, how, or was this, these were presumably secret negotiations that were going on? Um, well, that was a bit of a joke. I could never get on the negotiating committee. They kept me away from it. You weren't, right? you weren't popular, Mark, were you? <laughs> no, one I way wasn't. or another. Anyone that knows my story will tell you I, I was literally I was hated mm. because I was trying to expose them. Mm. I just didn't do a very good job of it. Um, I, w- I wish I'd, I'd been a bit more you know, steeped in the ways of the world. I, I would have made a better job of exposing what they were up to. Except you were on but your own by the sound of it. I, I, caused, I caused enough trouble to get them worried about me and regular attempts to have me voted off the executive were made. I would just go back to my region and they'd vote me straight back on again. So <laughs> it all got a bit silly in the end. Um, and I fell out with more than one general secretary, um, even though I played a, a role in getting the last general secretary elected. That was a guy called George Thompson. Um, he turned out to be a piece of work. Um, but uh, no, the, they ended up getting struck off as a trade union. The certification officer saw through them realized that they could not be a trade union should never have been a trade union and he struck them off when, when was, was that? that when was that <laughs> that would have been about 2013 i think it was oh, right. 2013 2015 but there were comments um, more recently weren't there in the fraser judgment i think about the role of the federation am i right that, um, that was yeah that was in relation to the uh, uh grant funding agreement that they struck what happened was when they got struck off they lost all their status as a trade union. A trade union is actually um, a pseudo corporate entity, a bit like a limited company. So without it, they were legally, they become an un- unincorporated association. So each member of the federation immediately became jointly and severally liable for anything that that organization did in the name of that organization. And the poor old assistant general secretary of the day, a lady called Uh, Marilyn Stoddard she was mortified by this and she immediately knew the risks Mm -hmm. and was imploring the executive council and the general secretary to incorporate as a limited company to give protection for the the management of that of that organization Um, but they dragged their feet for two years they spent two years floating around taking money off the post office as an unincorporated unincorporated association and the reason it took two years to get regularized was because there was two years of intense negotiations going on behind the scenes to create what we now know as the grant funding agreement. Uh, and it was that grant funding agreement they tried to keep secret. Yeah. And that's what Justice Fraser was referring to, because I was the one that exposed that agreement uh, and got it put into the public domain. Um, and it, 
it meant that Justice Fraser was able to read that agreement. And that's how he declared that the fact that the Federation were just in it to look after their own interests, not interested in helping members. And they become utterly beholden to the post office, because if they did anything that displeased the post office, within the terms of this grant funding agreement, their funding could be stopped and they would be bankrupt and destitute. So they, they you know, if the post was said to the Federation, as we know it today, jump, the post office, the Federation official would have to ask how high, because they know that the, the money's always being dangled yeah. over them. But it got worse because part of qualifying for this money, the post office insisted that the Federation incorporated as a limited company with its own board of directors. Um, now that scared the then ex-general secretary who announced himself to be the new CEO overnight. He wasn't elected or anything. Oh, I'm the CEO now. I was a general secretary yesterday. I'm the CEO now. And, I, and I've got all this money, two and a half million pounds a year for the next 15 years coming in and I'm going to be in control of all of that. So um, he suddenly realised that, hang on a minute, as a limited company, I'm at the beck and call of the members of this company because they, they constructed themselves as a company limited by guarantee. Therefore, there's no shareholders, but there are members who act very much like shareholders. And according to the grant funding agreement, every postmaster was going to be given uh, membership of this company uh, and the grant was based on the federation maintaining all those postmasters as members to be a member though you had to take on one of the post office's new contracts under network transformation um, and so the post office thought that they'd done it all right the problem is um, even though their articles of association say they're a company limited by guarantee the federation are yet to be able to prove they've actually got any properly signed up members of their company. The members of that company are just the directors. And I've asked every postmaster I've come across who thinks they're a member of the Federation, have you signed up your um, guarantee letter promising to pledge one pound in the event of um, the Federation not being able to meet its obligations? And have you pledged to be bound by their articles association? No. And that's now, is it? That's now. And I've yet to meet anyone that is a proper member of NFSP Limited. Now, I'm a member of several other companies limited by guarantee, the co-op being one, the Federation of Small Business being another. And they've all sent me these forms to sign before I can be a proper voting member of that company. But no one votes in AGMs at the Federation because they're not voting members. So Lord. we've got this you've got this document registered with company's house detailing how the membership should work. That was required by the post office's grant. But in practice, the Federation is not operating in, in accordance with its own articles association, which I believe is an offence under company law. But my, my door is open to the current CEO to at any time prove by producing his company register that he's got all these members he says he claims to have got that are correctly signed up members. So they're just being kept there by the post office as some form of human shield to take the blame for all the things the post office want to get done to postmasters because they just say Federation agreed it. Oh, goodness. We've negotiated with the Federation and they we, we came to this agreement. Therefore, we're going to change your contract. Therefore, we're going to impose changes to the way we pay you. Um, and all these changes are made and the letters are consistent. This has been done in agreement with the NFSP. And the postmasters think that that somehow makes a postmaster feel better. But because of the trials, the horizon trials, the Federation have been exposed to for what they are. And the most postmasters, all right thinking ones, have lost utter yeah. confidence in the Federation. And that they're beginning to wake up and realise what. Well, why are they consulted over matters concerning my contract that I hold at the post office? Yes, yeah. and are they joining the CWU then? Yeah, that we get we get members join. It's a trickle; has been a trickle over time. Um, when we when we formulated um, the federation at, at the time, did a very good job of uh, blackening our name. The 
the CWU were a militant trade union, siding with the hard left, always going on strike, <laughs> causing raw mail lots of problems. Don't you keep, don't you have anything to do with them, postmasters, because I'll have you out on strike before you can even blink. And you'll you'll lose all your money off your customers and all those. I mean, postmasters are swallowing this, I have to admit. But that's and so we struggle to get postmasters to take us seriously. So we play in the longer game. Um, we're trying to demonstrate through our actions in supporting postmasters in political debates, which we're quite good at lobbying members of parliament, supplying information to help MPs um, form committees or, or any debate on the post office. Um, and we're showing we're not the bad guys. We are actually the good guys. We've got your interests at heart. And, you know, and if only you would wake up and smell the coffee, you would come and join us because the bigger we get the more seriously the posters will take us and more likely to enter into a collective bargaining agreement because we will we will have our our union validated as being uh, having a lot of postmaster members mm -hmm. but at the moment we're bubbling around the 300 mark and it's difficult to um mount some form of campaign to recruit more because we've first of all got to overcome this problem. Which but, got when you, me... but when you describe this relationship between the post office and the Federation as it is now, mm. it implies a completely unreconstructed attitude by the post office to the sub postmasters. In other words, yeah. we keep them under their thumb uh, as powerless as possible for as long as possible, mm. um, just as they enjoyed previously, you know, when, when they were prosecuting them or... Um, Nothing, nothing has changed. Nothing has changed over the level of control that the post office exerts over choosing the representation that postmasters get. Which so, is extraordinary after the amount of bad publicity they've had. You'd think that they would be concerned to improve their image and improve their relationship with the sub postmasters, or at least I, the public I, view. I, I was jumping up and down with glee when Justice Fraser delivered his uh, common issues judgment where he made those critical remarks to the Federation, because I thought, surely now, with a new CEO, the post service is going to run a mile from the Federation, because they're, they're no longer of any use. They've been exposed. They're a puppet organisation. The post service fully funds them. Who's going to take the post service seriously when they say they've mm. run it past the Federation? No, it seems as if they've gone into overdrive to embellish the relationship they have with the Federation and to keep the, keep the corpse alive for as long as possible. And so you in the trade union movement can see this happening, but do you get an audience anywhere else or is it just regarded as a spat between unions and um, you know, parish pump politics? Or I mean, is anybody with any authority yeah. interested in what's happening? Not really. No, you're right. It's particularly with MPs, they fully understand the MPs we speak to and have great sympathy with us, but they don't want to get involved. And those words have been used that you just said. We don't want to get involved in an inter-union spat. Sort it out between yourselves. Haven't um, they noticed that the worst, one of the worst <laughs> scandals uh, is broken across the country? And, you yeah, know, you... and, and you've, got this, you've got this puppet organisation that still to this day is being used to justify serious changes to a postmaster's contract and, and, and income. Unbelievable. You know, yeah. And, and it's because, like everything throughout the Horizon scandal, whenever the people in ultimate power, government, are asked to do something about the post office, they just say, oh, it's not a matter for parliamentarians. This is a matter for the post office. They are, and I hate these this word, an arm's length organisation. Except and there's a minister they... in charge, isn't there? I thought there was a minister with responsibility. Oh, the yes. And there's a brand spanking new document that's just been drawn up to hold the post office to greater account by the, the Postal Affairs Minister. It's called a, a strategic framework document. And Nick Reed, the CEO, is held personally responsible for reporting certain nominated activities to the minister. Um, but when it comes to more detailed stuff, such as representation, that's not worthy of government's attention or the minister's attention. Yet that minister, that same minister, relies on using the NFSP as justification for some of the things government are doing, because he'll say, well, the Federation said it's all right. 
It's very I, depressing, isn't it? Parliament yesterday, there was a debate on the sustainability of the post office network. And if you listen to that debate, it's not very long. It's in yesterday morning and tabled by Marion Fellows. Um, even MPs during that debate were commenting on the NFSP as being a representative body that truly represented the interests of sub postmasters. So they haven't got it. They haven't got it. And then until representation is dealt with and postmasters are allowed to choose the organisation of their choice, we're not going to make any progress with the post office because nothing is changing. Uh, changes to the contract are being forced through without any adequate negotiation with the individual postmaster. In my contracts with the post office, if they want to change it, they should negotiate personally with me. I appreciate that they may not want to do that with 11,500 contract holders, but that's their problem. That is the legal way to do it. So the only other way around it is by turning to a representative body who can do the negotiation on behalf of those members and we call it collective bargaining yes and the federation is, the federation isn't in fact a trade union then even now it hasn't been since 2015 right and it and therefore it is just a private limited company albeit not run properly um but they have no legal right to interfere in postmasters contracts because they cannot it's impossible in law to hold a collective bargaining agreement unless you're a trade union isn't it unbelievable? Yes. It's... Wow. We're, we're silenced, Mark. It's <laughs> kind of astonishing. Yes. Yeah. Astonishing to hear that this is what's happening now. now. Well, I make a big the... thing of it because I passionately believe that all yeah. through the, the Horizon scandal, it could have only have got as bad as it did because there was no meaningful representation happening. There's no way in this world people yeah, like Nicky Art should have been allowed to go into a closed room with, with interrogators without representation. There's no way people should have tried to defend their own contract without representation. And it's this lack of representation that has allowed the posters to get away with what they did. And, yeah, if there'd been a proper trade union representing postmasters during those times, we wouldn't be having this conversation today. We're out to help them. We're not out to help ourselves. There's no, no union official in the CW gets anything out of it. Unlike the, the Federation, yeah. who, who have got two and a half billion pounds a year coming in to only spend on themselves. What are they doing with that money? Because they're certainly not doing any good for postmasters with it. So who's, be who's benefiting out of all this money? And why aren't the post office asking questions? Excuse me, uh, Mr. CEO of the NFSB, what are you doing with our money? Yeah. Yeah. But postmasters are quite happy with the situation because they've got they've got a pet organisation that they can use control. it for their own, own means. Yeah.